Hey, so the point of this thing is to have some fun, and it was fun. Uh, most of you guys, some of you guys participated, and that's fun. But this is kind of what I want you to think about right now as we dive into the message time this morning. When you received the encouragement, the invitation to be part of the Ugly Christmas Contest, all you had to do was wear a sweater, right? You put a sweater on because you know that was the invitation, that's what you're supposed to do. You show up to church, which is what you're supposed to do, it's what you know to do. But you didn't know what would happen after that, you just did what you knew to do. You put yourself in the right spot, you put the sweater on, some of you guys, that's a good one, Luke. Um, some of you guys here really went all out, but uh, you didn't know what the results were going to be. We had to choose, Ashley had to choose, you guys had to choose. And so part of it you controlled, part of it was out of your control, but some really cool things happened for three people. And a fourth who got a hug from Ashley. That's what we're going to talk about this morning, how we need to put ourselves in the right spot to be able to experience God's blessing and to be directed in our lives. We also need to be able to hear and be sensitive to the voice of God, because I believe that God's speaking to us far more often than we ever choose to listen. And I want us to be listeners to the voice of God. I want us to be responsive to the voice of God, and not just people who think God speaks to other people. The Bible is full of characters, and characters in the Bible are just like you and just like me. And I don't want you to think about them in a different way than you would think about yourself, your family members, your friends, those who you go to church with. They're just people. And as we read about these stories in the Bible, they're people with hopes, with fears, with concerns, with difficult times, trials in life, great times of success and blessing, but they are just like you and just like me. You can be the kind of person who God uses in profound ways. Your life can be on mission in a way that you never thought possible, and God has created you for a purpose. You are intentional, and you're necessary. And so as I talk to you today about a really simple story, I'm just going to talk to you through a couple points I think are important. And um, we're going to discuss some things and end with an uh, application um, where God gave me a gift because I put myself in a spot where I knew I should be, and um, listened to the gentle nudge of the Holy Spirit, and I received the gift of a broken heart, which is something we all need, because it's through a broken heart that God motivates us to action and builds up this passion in us that will make the difference in and through us as we commit more and more to Him. So I'm going to talk to you about a story right now from Luke chapter 2. Now Luke was concerned about historical accuracy. He was concerned about witnesses and things that would hold up in court. So when Luke wrote stories, when he wrote the gospel, he was thinking about historical figures, dates, times, stuff that you could um, pinpoint uh, in history so that people who may question if Jesus really was the Messiah, when He really was born, when these things happened, there would be direct ties. He was very, very detail-oriented, and in this particular case, at the end of Luke chapter 2, Jesus had already been born, and Luke needed to, to bring about or to point out three witnesses. Because in Old Testament law, you had to have three witnesses for something to be considered true. If you went to court, you had to have three witnesses that would be able to say somebody did or did not do something. And if you had three witnesses, then that was enough proof for people to be able to make a decision and, uh, and, and to, to kind of go on from there with life or whatever hung in the balance. Now, there are two types of people who couldn't be witnesses. One was a shepherd, that was one. A tax collector couldn't be witnesses, but beyond that, they let folks be witnesses. Now, the three witnesses we find at the end of this section of Luke chapter 2 are first, Mary and Joseph. Now, unfortunately, Mary and Joseph only counted as one, because back in the day, in the Old Testament way, uh, the Jews only counted men. Uh, they didn't count women. They didn't let women's testimony count. Jesus changed all of that, fortunately. But uh, Mary and Joseph counted as one. A lady named Anna counted as, as another one. And, and then we have this third guy whose sole purpose in life was to meet Jesus. As a matter of fact, he was told, and you'll see this in just a second, that before he died, he would be able to meet and see Jesus. Now, the Old Testament Jews, they didn't really know. I mean, the Bible had talked about how Jesus would come, but there were different uh, differences of opinion. They expected in some cases for on a cloudy day for the clouds to part and a sunbeam would come through, and on that sunbeam would come Jesus, you know, surfing the sunbeam down to earth and hit it in all of His glory, and everybody would say, the Messiah, there He is. Some people believed He would come like a gladiator, a great orator, a politician 
who you would want to follow just because of his charisma and the fact that he could handle whatever business needed to be handled with the Romans. But very few really expected, well, Jesus to be born, of two parents who were of little account according to the society of the day in a town that was a nothing town, a birth just like any other birth, but a baby unlike any other baby. And you have a man who'd been promised, before you die, you will meet Jesus. So I want to talk to you about what it is that we need to do in our lives, the example we can follow from this particular story to, for us to put ourselves in the right spot, the right place, the right situation, for us to be able to experience what's really important in life. This last year, we've talked about nudging people toward Jesus, how important it was to Jesus, thinking the thoughts Jesus would think, doing the things that Jesus would do, caring about the things Jesus would care about. Well, 2020 is going to be full of opportunities for you to get involved. And for you to get involved and for you to be on mission, to accept this Great Commission mission, you've got to be able to hear this nudging from the Holy Spirit and to respond. And it's a stretch or a challenge because most of the time, God wants to speak to us far more than we are willing to listen to Him. Let's read the Scripture together. I want to talk to you a little bit about some background so you understand what's going on. And we're going to get right to the point. And I'm going to show you some pictures of something that happened to me last Sunday afternoon that I thought was super cool. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. Took their baby Jesus to Jerusalem. As it's written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now, you might think, so what, right off the you know, top of your head, because you don't understand culture and the Jewish tradition and what the law suggested, but what a woman had to do if she had a baby is wait 40 days after the delivery of the baby because Jewish Old Testament law considered a woman to be unclean, ceremonially, ritually unclean for 40 days. At the end of the 40 days, she would have to go to the temple and make an offering and a sacrifice. And if she did that, then she could worship again in the temple. And so 40 days after childbirth, she would have to go. Now, there was another tradition that was important. It was um, uh, common with the Jewish people, and that is that when they had a firstborn male, they would have to offer a tax or they would have to offer a ransom, and this ransom would ransom this firstborn male child out of the priesthood, unless they were born of a certain tribe and then all firstborn males became priests. But Jesus was technically born as the firstborn child, and so what Mary and Joseph would do is when they went to the temple, they would offer this five shekel offering. So it was really ceremonial. Jesus didn't have to be a priest that he could go back and do whatever it was that he was called to do. Now, we know what he was called to do. Mary and Joseph still figuring it out, believing it. But I mean, this was a one day at a time, one step after another, and they were doing exactly what they knew they needed to do. Now, that's the first point that I want to make with you today, is that for us, to be able to be really used by God, we have to do the things we know we need to do. I think that's a significant point, and I think it's a point that maybe is lost on some of us. And one of the ways that God speaks to us is through Scripture and through the things that He tells us we should believe, the things that we should do, the things that should be important to us, how we should live. And I believe, as I've said to you many times, that most, if not all, of the mistakes that we make in life could have been prevented or avoided if we had been more careful to consult Scripture and to apply God's Word to our life. That's why I stand up here and teach every Sunday. That's why you study and read during the week. There are two things about Scripture that are true. One is that it has the authority, the God-given, God-inspired authority, for us to be able to apply these things to our life. And for these things to make a difference and be absolutely, literally true. God's Word, it is objective truth. Some of us don't like it. Maybe it's culturally unpopular. Maybe it disconnects from some of the things that maybe you've learned or have held dear to you. But I believe that the Bible in its original form as inspired by the Holy Spirit is absolutely 100% completely true. 
That's one of the reasons we take it so seriously. It's what we do in our small groups, in our classes on Sunday morning. It's the way or the reason that we open the Word every single Sunday and work through it so carefully. And so I believe we have to be people of the Word. We have to embrace God's Word and we have to apply God's Word. So that's the first suggestion that I want to give to you. We'll continue in that together because that's the only way that a church should continue. But that's the way that Mary and Joseph were living their life. They showed up and did exactly what the Old Testament law had said uh, that they should do. And in verse 25, we're introduced to another character, Simeon. And we don't know anything about Simeon, not much about Simeon. He's just a guy who God had chosen to meet Jesus and to be a witness as to the, to the legitimacy, to the fact that Jesus really was this Messiah, Simeon. Now, the Bible says he was righteous and he was devout. I want to explain those two words to you because they're important words. The word righteous, it doesn't mean he was perfect. It doesn't mean that he was holy, 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 holier than thou. It doesn't mean that he walked on a cloud. It doesn't mean, what this means is, is that he had a heart that was pointed toward God. That he had decided that in his life, he wanted God to be the most important person, and his relationship with God was was all that mattered to him. Now, if I were to ask you that same question, is God the most important person in your life? Do you want to be a man or woman after God's own heart? I think most of you would raise your hand and say yes. Many of us have the words um, to back that up. But not all of us have the choices to back that up. The second word here is really important. It says that he was righteous and that he was devout. Now, the word devout means cautious. It means that he thought through his life. He thought through his actions. He was cautious to make sure that the things he thought about, the way he spent his money, the things he did with his time, that they matched up with the conviction that he says he has in his heart, the conviction that he had with his mouth, that he wanted to be a man of God. He walked the talk. He backed it up by being cautious about his life. I was very important, but there's more to this man. And this is where things get a little, well, more difficult, a little more mysterious. Um, We'll talk about it. There was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon. He was both righteous and devout. And he was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Now, that's a significant statement. It had been revealed to him through the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit indwells the life of a believer for you and for me after Pentecost that we read about in the New Testament and the book of Acts. The Holy Spirit, once we become a believer in Jesus Christ, comes and lives within us and teaches us truth from the inside out and convicts us of sin and encourages us and strengthens us. But back in this day before Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came upon people And it was always for a period of time and for a specific purpose. Now, the Holy Spirit spoke to Simeon, and Simeon heard from the Holy Spirit and knew that this was God talking. And I think the million-dollar question for us is, when we hear from God, how in the world do we know this impression is from God? How do we know for sure that it's God talking? Because if we're going to step out in faith, we want to know for sure, or at least be reasonably sure. It's not a new suggestion. It's not a new theme, not a new subject. We've discussed it even in the last few weeks, but over the next two or three weeks, you and I are going to talk about this even more in depth. I'm going to teach next week from a book I've never preached on before, Habakkuk. And I'm going to talk to you about five ways to hear from God. Five things that we should do, patterns, habits, characteristics in our life that will allow us to hear from God. But that really is the most important thing as we try to discern God's will. How do we put ourselves in the spot for God to be able to do these amazing things in and through us? So he had, it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he wouldn't die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. That's an important fact. So then what happened? In verse 27, moved by the Spirit, he went to the temple courts. So this was a guy who had an impression, who had a thought, he had formed a conclusion that God had told him that he wouldn't die before he met Jesus. Now, that's an important thing. He had accepted it as true. And then one day, just like any other day, I'm sure, just like any other day, without expectation that everything could change that day, but maybe the cautious awareness or hope that it might, he was moved in his spirit to go do something. God put him in a spot where he met 
the promise that God had made for him and changed his life forever. Very simply moved by the Spirit, he went to the temple courts. When the parents brought in this child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God. Now, how in the world would Simeon have found this child over the thousands of people who were there, all the babies who all kind of look alike? I mean, your baby looks different, but most people who don't have a baby think all the babies look the same. They're all cute. How in the world would you know? All parents look the same. They're all milling around doing their thing. God was working all of the billions of circumstances together in life to bring about his perfect plan. And we see two things happening here. One, you see obedience to the word and the law of God. Doing what it is you know to do. Being the kind of person you know we should be. But then being sensitive to God's voice and acting on that so that you're in the right spot for everything that you've been hoping for to happen. All the promises to come true. Well, Simeon took this baby in his arms and praised God. He said, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, the child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. And we don't have time to talk about 34 and 35, although they're really interesting, but I want us to move back to this idea of hearing the voice of God. And I'm going to remind you of some things we discussed a couple of weeks ago and maybe install in you some thoughts that we're going to develop over the next couple of weeks. But how do you know for sure that you're hearing the voice of God? What I want for you more than anything else is for as you live 2020, for you to get to the end of that together, us as a church family, and for you to look back and say, I've lived my life according to the will of God, hearing the voice of God and responding to be able to look back and say, I've invested in the lives of other people. I haven't spent my time on myself, that I care about the things that Jesus cares about, to be transformed, to be a different person. And to do that, we have to hear from God. I want wisdom, because wisdom is a view of life from God's perspective. The book of James tells us that if we ask for wisdom, that God gives us wisdom, that all we have to do and ask is ask. But if we ask, we have to decide ahead of time that when we know what God wants us to do, we're going to do it. But if we're just trying to evaluate what He wants, and we're not positive that we're going to obey, He's never going to tell us ahead of time what it is that He wants for us. That we have to make the decision in our mind and in our heart, yes, God, I will obey no matter what it is. I will follow You. So here are some questions you may ask as you are praying and developing these impressions, these thoughts from God. The first one, is it biblical? Because God never will ask you to do something contrary to His Word. It's impossible for God to contradict His character. The first question, is it biblical? Not a new question for you, but a question again. Many times we overlook. The second question, will it make me more like Jesus? Oftentimes, when we discern God's voice, we put ourselves in the center of the story. We are the main actor, and everyone else the supporting cast. But Jesus lived his life in a way that showed us that service to others, that if you want to live high, you have to be willing to go low was really the secret to the kingdom, and that his value system was totally different than our value system. Is what God's leading me to do, was it going to make me more like Jesus? Well, here's a little supporting thought here, number three, and that is, that does it build me up, or does it build God's kingdom up? If we're receiving these instructions or impressions from God, thinking we hear from God, but it builds us up, puts us in a position where we can puff up, and people will look at us and compliment us, it's not God. But if it builds up God's kingdom, perhaps it's His voice. Number four, does my church family or small group confirm it? When we try to make decisions ourselves, we make bad decisions. How many times have I shared with you, and I know you agree, 
But if you don't have people around you who you trust, whose lives you would like to be like spiritually, whose commitments to the Lord you would like to be like spiritually, who will tell you the truth about what they believe, who want for you God's will more than they want their will for you, well, you have the basis of discerning these impressions and deciding whether or not it's God or whether it's just you trying to disguise it in spiritual language. Number five, is it consistent with who God's made me to be? Number six, is it conviction or condemnation? I had an acquaintance who, when I would teach from time to time, would come back and respond to me that God had really been speaking to them. And I always ask, well, what did he say? But it was always something uh, that was just so harsh. It was so um, graceless. It was so devoid of anything that sounded like love. It was a stop it, stop it, stop it, change it, change it, change it. You're a terrible person. And it was easy to see that they were projecting other issues, maybe from their own uh, childhood, their own parents, their own relationships and personality onto God or God's voice. And I read the whole counsel of Scripture and what I know about Jesus, and certainly there's conviction of the Holy Spirit when we step out of line of His plan. But there's also grace and love and encouragement. Is it conviction or condemnation? Because if it's condemnation, that's not from God. Conviction oftentimes is. And finally, do I sense God's peace? Now, this is not, do I sense God's convenience? It's, do I sense God's peace? The kind of peace, God's peace, that blows the human mind. The kind of peace that stands guard over my heart in Christ Jesus. Does this impression give me peace? When you put yourself in a place where you're following the voice of God, God will do things in you that are greater than you ever thought possible, not to build you up, but to build himself up. I had an experience last week that I want to share with you, and in a way, all of you are tied to this experience. I mentioned to you a month ago that stories are the currency, in my opinion, of our spiritual lives. Stories are the currency of our testimony. If I ask you guys, what is the time in your life when you felt the most connected to God? Tell me about the spiritual high points in your life. Talk to me about who God is in your life. What shaped you the most in your life? If you're like most people, you go back to a time that's happened in a previous sort of era in your existence. Maybe it's back to a youth camp. Maybe it's back to a conversation with a friend. Maybe it was a mentor. Maybe it was a youth pastor. And you go back in time to these experiences. Maybe it's a trip. But stories are important. And for us to be able to tell the story of what God's doing in our life, to be able to tell the story of how important His kingdom and His values are, well, that's what I want for you. Now, when you ask some people about their own spiritual lives, even about their church, they tell you all about how it affects them. Oh, I like the music. I like the preaching. I like my class. I like my... And it's all about them. They're in the very center of the circle, and everything about it has to do with them. And they tell you about all the stuff they like because of how it makes them feel. Now, I want us to be the kind of church that has awesome music, and I believe we do. Great classes, all kinds of things that people like and enjoy. And, but that's not the point. It's not the reason we do what we do. When someone asks you about your church, the story that I want you to tell is about the mission that God has put us on, where none of us are the main actor in this story, that Jesus Christ is the main actor, that the world around us and the opportunities around us are the point, and that all we are is a supporting cast member. But that puts us exactly where we need to be, right in the center of God's plan. I want each of you to have stories, but these are stories about God's grace, about His mercy, His redemptive purpose, and how He's blessed you by allowing you to be part of it. This happened to me last week, last Sunday. Now, we had a partnership, have a partnership with uh, two different school districts, Saydale School District and the Des Moines School District. And the purpose of the partnership is for us to provide Christmas presents for kids who would otherwise be unable to have 
Christmas. You heard about this. Our church was so generous. You guys were so generous this year. I cannot tell you, there have been multiple times when in my own quiet moments as I'm thinking and praying for you and praying uh, about you, that I've been overwhelmed with your generosity because you are a giving church. And that was evidenced by these Christmas ornaments that were brought back and the bags of presents that went far over and above the things that were written on these tags that these kids dared to ask for or need. And then there's a picture of, and by the way, these are my pictures. Now, I'm going to tell you right off the bat, I take terrible pictures. I use my cell phone. I very rarely stop walking when I take pictures. And so these pictures are just for me to show you, you know, just a visual of what I'm talking about. Now, this is sort of important because I'm going to take you into a neighborhood you don't normally go, into a situation that many of you don't normally see. And I want to show you the pictures. Now, I didn't take pictures in a way that would take anyone's dignity away because we would never do that in a million years. So I tried to take pictures that were subtle, pictures that were appropriate, the pictures that would remind me of the experience that, that I went through. Now, we had 300 Christmas ornaments plus. You guys brought all these Christmas ornaments back, and they were all in this room. And we set this structure up, this Christmas present initiative or partnership up in a way where parents can come to the church and to the gym in a way that's very uh, um, safe, very anonymous, pick up these presents and take them back to their own homes and provide Christmas for their families. Because that really is the gift that we can give to some parents who may be financially struggling, and that's the gift of the ability to provide Christmas for their own kids in whatever tradition that they have. Now, some of the families weren't able to or were unwilling to come pick up presents. And so the responsibility, the privilege, um, just falls on us. Now, who's the us? Well, it's those of us who are involved in City Surf, who are in motion serving these teachers and serving these schools, who are around, who are engaged, because it's within this system and this structure of service that all these supernatural opportunities pop up, because we're putting ourselves in the place where we need to be, doing, doing what we know we need to do so that we can hear the prompting of the Holy Spirit to be right in a sweet spot that will give you the gift of a broken heart. This came to me last Sunday afternoon after we had spent two days in the living nativity, and we had three days of living nativity. Saturday night was freezing, eight degrees with a wind chill of one. All of us were tired, and um, on Sunday afternoon after church, I wanted to go home, I wanted to take a nap, and I wanted to watch football. And I got a phone call, um, a text from one of my friends here in church who is a teacher at one of these schools. Now, it's cool for us because we partner with teachers, right? We can't touch every single child. Impossible. But we can sponsor or support 300 teachers who in turn have 30 kids per class. So we have nine or 10,000 kids across our metro who we are partnering with on a regular basis. But there's one teacher who happened to work at one of the schools that we partner with who was going to deliver some presents. And they texted and said, hey, do you want to go with us and deliver presents? Now, I'll be perfectly transparent with you. I love hanging out with these guys. And we do. But I didn't want to on Sunday afternoon. Now, here's what I did. I prayed about it. Um, it was a short prayer. I got to tell you, it really was. It was like, God, do I need to go and help deliver these presents? And the Holy Spirit and my wife very quickly said, yes, you need to go. And so I responded and said, yeah. Now, how, how big a deal is that? Well, for some of us, it's a huge deal. Couch, driving around in the middle of the inner city delivering presents. What did I do? Well, I went. I put myself in the spot where I needed to go, listened to the voice of God, and tried to be obedient. And here's what happened. We went down to a neighborhood, Connie, Dixie, Anthony, Lauren, Joy, and myself, in a convoy, three cars, packed full of presents pulled into a condo complex that, um, I mean, it was bad. Boarded up windows, trash piled up everywhere. It was sad. I look up, I see Lauren taking off down this alley, and Anthony were like, man, who's going to do security? We were worried. I mean, you know, um, walking right up to a house, banging on the door. They wouldn't answer the door. I realized it was because Anthony and I were there, and we looked like cops. 
Um, I didn't know why. So we backed up about 100 feet. So it was just Connie, Dixie, Joy, Lauren. They opened the door. Little kid opens the door, shuts the door, right? Little bit bigger kid opens the door who has to take care of his kids most of the time, his brothers and sisters, because his mom and dad are not around. We had bags and bags and bags of presents. As Anthony and Lauren and Connie and Dixie took the presents inside the house and set them on the landing, they were overwhelmed with a couple things. Anthony came back to me and he said, this is the worst place I've ever seen. We had a quick conversation and he said, I've driven past this place hundreds of times, but never even knew it was here. Remember that? I've done the exact same thing. Driven past it 100 times, but never noticed it was there. One of the little kids yelled from up the stairs, what is that? Didn't even understand Christmas presents. They gave. Lauren, a teacher who cares about these kids every single day, points out needs to us that we've been able to meet as a church family. Kids who have lice, the school does, don't have lice kits. Kids who have bed bugs and aren't, don't have the ability to spray. People who have fires and need things for kids to wear. Calling the church, allowing us through CityServe to be able to engage these teachers every single day. She walked in and she grabbed this kid who opened the door and hugged him. There's a picture of that. And that picture right there is city served to me. We went to another house. This other house is a grandmother. This grandmother's raising 10 grandkids because her kids dumped her kids off with her. 10 of them. This lady works as a bus assistant in a tiny little home that can't be more than 800 square feet. Anthony, Lauren, Joy, Connie, Dixie, took bags and bags and bags of presents to this grandmother who was overwhelmed that she was able to provide Christmas for her 10 grandkids who she's raising, trying to do the right thing in a situation that she didn't create. And I realized as I'm standing there watching them that this is Jesus. This is what Jesus does. The last picture I want to show you is a picture of a teddy bear. And Lauren texted me this picture the other day because she and Anthony made another delivery. And this teddy bear was the prized possession of a little girl who when she received the Christmas presents from you guys, from the church, wouldn't receive these presents without giving a gift back in return. She would not let Lauren leave without taking her teddy bear as a thank you. And I got the gift of a broken heart. And I walked away on Sunday afternoon, never more motivated or more passionate or more focused to do the things that God has called us to do as a church, to make a difference in this world around us because the gospel is all that matters. And it wasn't that complicated. We're going to be talking quite a bit about doing what it is we know to do and being sensitive as we listen to the voice of God as He changes our hearts and changes our lives. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for my friends.